Amen. So, of course, there in Genesis chapter 3, um, you might even know where I'm going, uh, given the fact that it's Mother's Day today, and you can't be a preacher and not preach a Mother's Day sermon on Mother's Day. I mean, I guess you could, but it would be a long ride home back to Phoenix for you. <laughs> so, not that it's something I have to make myself preach. I, I think it's a great topic to preach on. Quite honestly, it's not something I think that we hear enough preaching about, about mothering and parenting in general. Um, I mean, when you think about mothers, they think about a lot of the, the work that they do and really how much we should appreciate it. We should appreciate the work of a mother. Uh, if we were to go around and ask people what comes to mind when you think about your mother or what, what do you think about mothering, you know, you're probably going to recall something that involved her doing something for you or doing something for another sibling or something like that. Mothers, uh, mothers are very, always very busy helping and serving others. So it's important that we take time, I think, at least once a year to step back and really honestly appreciate the work that a mother does. I mean, it's one day out of the year, but they really don't have a day off if, if they're doing it right. I mean, a mother that's working and, and being a good mother, and she's on call 24-7, you know, uh, nonstop. So I think one day out of the year isn't too bad to step back and, and express some gratitude for what mothers do. Amen. Uh, you know, if we understood the realities of what mothers did, we might better appreciate that. And really, that's kind of the direction I want to go this morning with this sermon, is to talk more bluntly about the realities of motherhood. I mean, it'd be really nice to get up here and preach the real inspiring, moving, and, and gentle message about, and, 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 you know, bring up some poetic quotes about motherhood and stuff like that. And I enjoy all that stuff and, and have a very touching sermon. But really what's needed today in America is for people to understand the realities of motherhood, the, the, the harsh realities, right, of, of bearing children and of raising children. Because it's a difficult job. It's a very difficult job. And as we'll see here, there's a lot of people here that would rather prefer, prefer just to avoid that work altogether. But a mother is somebody who does, uh, does a great deal of work and it's something that we need to appreciate. Of course, it says there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So we have to recall, of course, we're probably familiar uh, with at least this much of the scripture. Uh, you know, that in Genesis 3, we have the fall of man, where he's, uh, you know, Eve has eaten of the knowledge of good and evil, and it has, uh, you know, Adam has chosen to eat as well, and they've both fallen into a state of sin, and God catches them and calls them on the carpet. And, of course, he doles out punishments to those that were guilty. He doles out the punishment to the man, to the serpent, and also to the woman. And part of that punishment that woman is given here is that she will greatly multiply, that he would greatly multiply her sorrow and her conception. And sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. Now, I don't know before the fall, if childbirth would have been something, uh, you know, pleasurable at all. That it would be something that is, is, is less painful or less uh, of a danger than it is today. But whatever, however bad it was then, it's even worse now. And that's part of because of the curse that God has put on the earth. And I don't want to say this insensitively or come across the wrong way. We have to understand today that, and to some degree, mothers are operating as such under the curse of God. Uh, you know, bringing forth children is part of that uh, part of that punishment that has been put upon mankind, and you know that's something that we have to keep in mind because the work of being a mother involves some sorrow. It involves, as it says there, that she would multiply a, 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 the, her conception in sorrow, that she would bring forth children in sorrow. So the work of bearing children, of course, is probably one of the, you know, the primary works that a mother would do. Of course, that's what makes a mother a mother, is the fact that she has brought forth children. So the work of bearing children is the work of mother. And of course, it says right here that that work of bringing forth children is something that is going to be done in sorrow, that it is a sorrowful thing. Now, it's not something that you should rejoice over or be happy about or, or, or be glad to have children, but what's saying is that there was always, there's actually going to be some elements of it, you know, physically, that are very difficult, that they're going to bring sorrow into a person's life. And we think about just some of the, you know, we have four children now, so we're, we're fairly familiar with the things that go on. My wife, obviously, much more so than myself, about some of the things that go along with bearing children. You know, we think of the morning sickness. That's one of the first signs of pregnancy was when mom suddenly becomes nauseous. Things that used to seem appealing as far as food are now repulsive to her. Certain smells can trigger this. It's just something she wakes up and has 
you know, and can for some ladies get very intense and go on for a very long time. And there's and there's certain things that can be help to remedy that. But I think they all experience it to some degree or another. Now I don't know that right there is enough for me to just get down on my knees and thank God that I'm a man, right? Because I get sick and I'm a big baby. And I get a little. I had a little bit of a stomach bug, and I think my wife goes through this for weeks, months. You know, I think God did that this last Thursday just to remind me on Mother's Day exactly what my wife has gone through for me because it's it's intense. I can't imagine it. Uh, it's it's really something that they have to go through. So we would say, oh, morning sickness isn't that bad. Well, if you had to go through it, you might have a different opinion. So that's part of that sorrow, isn't it? That that mothers, even just getting pregnant, that one, that first part of it, just having to go through the morning sickness, or not to mention the discomfort of pregnancy. You know, having to, uh, you know, as the child grows and, and becoming, you know, the clothes don't fit right. If you live here in Arizona, you know, if you're going through a summer, that can be very uncomfortable. There's the back pains, all everything that's going on with her body. That's a very sorrowful thing. It's a very difficult thing. It's not easy. I'm here to tell you this morning that, you know, being a mother is work from right out of the gate, from day one. Before that child's even born, mothers are working. And there's a lot of sorrow that's involved in it. You know, we think all, uh, also of the unfortunate uh, incidents of miscarriages, or worse yet, even stillbirth. I mean, we can see what God says here, that there's going to be sorrow in a woman's conception. That there's going to be difficult times, that it's not what it used to be. And of course, we think about maybe other aspects that we could say, but that's a sorrowful aspect of being a mother. And that would be, I would think, of one thing is sleep deprivation. You know, a mother has to get up at all hours of night, feed that child, take care of that child. We had that stomach bug blow through our house, and when little Corbin John woke up at 1.32 o'clock that night and, and vomited all over his uh, bedroom, it wasn't me getting up. You know, and she got up and she took care of that and she did that and she did that work and I'm grateful for that. But I mean, sleep deprivation is a real part of being a mother. Having to go without the sleep, without the rest that's needed. I was just talking to my sister on the way down here this morning and she expressed that fact to me. She's got a few children of her own now and saying it just seems like I'm in a constant state of never having got a full night's sleep for years. And I said, I can sympathize to a degree, you know, uh, my, my wife would probably be able to do much more so. But this is part of the sorrow that goes along with being motherhood. And it just goes to show us that being a mother is work, that it is something that involves work and sorrow. Not to mention the fact that it's dangerous. I mean, childbirth itself is dangerous, and I don't want to frighten anybody, and I don't want to, you know, make people nervous about this, but it's the facts. It's, and this will help us appreciate being a mother even more. I mean, we could turn to passages, even the Word of God, where we see where women had uh, hard labor and to the point where they even passed away. And today in our country, you know, as, le as safe as it has become with all the medical advancements and all the technology that's out there, that even today in America, we still, women still suffer from this to the point where they even die. Uh, it says that they had about 700 women die each year in the U.S. So, you know, we should never, you know, so call your mother, okay? You know, the, you know, take the time to express some gratitude at least one day of the year towards your mother. Because really, when you think about it, when your mother gave birth to you, she went through the jaws of death. I mean, I don't say that, you know, over dramatically. That's really what happens. Women, uh, literally, to, even to this day, in this country, uh, of, of approximately 700 die each year for complications in labor or pregnancy. Now, you, now, I don't want to make you nervous, that's a small fraction, about 3.8 million women gave birth in 2017, so do the math, it's a very small fraction, but that's not to take it for granted. And of course, in times past, without those medical advancements, yeah. I mean, people probably took it a lot more seriously. It was a lot more, uh, a lot more of an act of faith and, and having to trust in God and, and, and making sure everything uh, goes, uh, goes well. So, of course, I don't want to dwell on that thought, but it is something that needs to be mentioned. And if we're going to think about what mothers go through today and try to, uh, you know, stir up some gratitude for our mothers that might even last, I don't know, maybe hopefully throughout the week, maybe month, you know, not just one day out of the year, maybe it would give us a better perspective for mothers for the rest of our lives. We need to talk about these things. And the fact is that it's, it's sorrowful, it's dangerous, and it's also painful. I mean, we, could, we don't have to go into great detail about that, 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 uh, it is a painful thing. I'm not going to, you know, sugarcoat that. I'm not going to uh, do uh, to anybody what, what uh, my mother and aunt did to my older sister when she gave birth for the first time and she asked them, is it painful? And they said, no, dear. The movies exaggerate. It's really not that bad. And they were sheltering her from that pain. 
And uh, of course, she found out the reality of it later and was, and was not appreciative of that. She would rather have just been told. So, uh, you know, the, the fact is, is that there's a lot that goes in to just, and we're just, we're, we haven't even gotten to the point of actually raising the child. We're just talking about conception, what goes along with that, childbirth, what goes along with that. And you can see already, you know, why it's appropriate to set aside a day and, and to talk about mothers and what they do for us. Amen. It's just the beginning that we've talked about. And if you haven't caught on what I'm talking about so far, I'll just go ahead and give you the title. But the title of the sermon this morning is Motherhood is Work. Motherhood is Work. And we see that right out of the gate. Right out of the gate, mothers are already having to sacrifice and, and put themselves through discomfort and even danger to some degree just to bring children into this world. And then we have to talk about, of course, the work that goes into even raising children. I mean, that's a whole other world that opens up. <clears throat> Once mothers have uh, you know, brought forth their children and they have you know, recovered from that, that whole process of recovery from childbirth, then they get to endeavor in that lifelong pursuit of starting to teach those children, trying, starting to train and raise those children for, for God. That's a lot of work. I dare say that's more work than anything thus far that we've talked about. Because that's something that goes on day in, day out, until those children are adults. And that's something that requires a lot of work. And it's something that we really need to focus on today. Because I'll tell you right now, godly children, and of course everyone you know, I would trust in this room that has children would love to see their kids grow up and live for God and to obey the commandments of God and to live uh, lives that are pleasing to God. But that doesn't happen by accident. You're not just going to wake up one day and have godly children. That, that is something that has to be done uh, on purpose. That is something that has to be done intentionally in, a, in an adult's life. And a great deal of that falls on the mother. I and mean, we think about the roles that men and women are given in, Bi in the Bible, that uh, men are supposed to be the providers. They're the ones that are go out and to earn a living and to provide for their house and to provide the income so that the mothers can stay home and raise the children. So really, a lot of how those children are going to turn out falls on the mother's shoulders. It falls. It's her responsibility to a great... I'm not saying dad doesn't play a part in this. Obviously, he does. But let's face facts. I mean, the kids are you know, ideally spending most of their time with mom. Most of their time being taught on mom's lap. Most of the time being uh, schooled by mom. Most of the time being taught uh, about life and the Bible from mom. That's where they're learning a lot of it because God, uh, dad is busy doing the things that he needs to do. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, it's an interesting word that it uses there, and it actually uses the word train. And we need to think about what that word even means, training, to be in training. That is an ongoing process that accomplishes a desired goal. Uh, nobody, you know, we think about if, if you've ever gotten into any kind of uh, serious weightlifting or anything like that, you'll hear the term uh, training as opposed to the word exercise. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do to go out and exercise and get nothing accomplished. You can break a sweat and get your heart rate up, but you're not going to put on muscle. You're not going to gain strength. You're not going to uh, accomplish anything. You're just, you know, you're just working out, as they say. You know, you could go spend time doing this or that. But if you're serious about gaining strength, if you're serious about accomplishing a goal physically, you have to have a regimen. You have to have a structure to that training. There has to be a certain day when you're going to do this and you're going to do this the next day and that the next day. You have to watch your diet. You have to make sure you recover. There's a lot of things that go into training when we talk about even just in from an exercise routine. Well, there's a lot more that goes into training up a child. I mean, it's the same thing. You know, children aren't just going to turn out living for God one day. They're, you know, uh, by accident, by you just... Uh, you know, not having any purpose, not having any goal, not having any kind of a regimen in your life for those children. What, are, what is it that we're trying to accomplish with our children? What is it that we are trying to teach them? What is it they, they need to know in order for them to turn out right and to not depart from God when they are older? <clears throat> well, a big part of that, of course, and if you would, turn over to Proverbs 23, because people, they need to be reminded of this, that this is still in the Bible, it hasn't gone away. A big part of that, of course, and this isn't the only part of it, but a significant part of this is discipline in a child's life. And this is a big part of rearing godly children. Uh, this is something that needs to be in place. If it's not there, 
Uh, it's not going to work. I don't care how good your homeschooling is. I don't care how much Bible reading you're doing. I don't care. If you're this part of, of the element, if this element of child rearing is not there, it's not going to work. And that would be, of course, correction. It says here in Proverbs 23, verse 13, Withhold not correction for the, the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod. That doesn't sound like a suggestion. That sounds like God expects us to, and it uses the word beat. Yep. Okay? And I know today that has a little bit of a different connotation. If we say beat, you know, we think about slapping someone around the, the head, neck, and shoulders, right? Well, that's not what the Bible's talking about here. It's, uh, it's talking about using a rod, and God has uh, provided a place on the, the human anatomy where the rod of instruction can be applied to the seat of learning, as, it, as, as folks often like to say, right? And that would be your posterior anatomy. That would be, uh, you know, the backside. That's what we're talking about here. Nice, soft, uh, cushiony spot that has a lot of nerve endings that can, that can uh, uh, feel a stinging sensation without having a, uh, a great deal of, you know, permanent damage inflicted on them, right? We're talking about spanking. Yep. Families, come on, say it. Amen. We're talking about taking a paddle. You know, it says here a rod. I don't necessarily think you have to go out and get a rod, although that is the Bible says, and if that's what you want to use, you know, do what you want in your home. But I think we use a paddle, we use a belt, that kind of a thing. And we spank our children when they do wrong. Amen. And what, do we do that because we enjoy it? Do we do that because we like hearing our children cry out and seeing their little legs shake, you know, when they're getting their spanking and having to go through that whole uh, tra traumatic thing sometimes where it's just the, it seems like it's the end of the world. No, we don't enjoy it. But I tell you what, it's necessary. And if we withhold correction from the child, you know, the Bible says, Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. I mean, I, I certainly would hate to see my children grow up and reject God one day because I couldn't be bothered to do what the Bible says and simply correct my children. And this is something, this is an element of child rearing that must be here, must be there. And, and it falls a lot on mothers today. It falls a lot on them because, again, they're the ones that are, are spending time with them. They're the ones that are there when the child misbehaves. I mean, when children are little, you know, you can't, you can't wait till dad comes home because they forget what they're even getting spanked for. You can't say, oh, when dad gets home to the two-year-old, to the three-year-old. They're not going to understand. They don't, the, 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 they're like a goldfish, right? The short-term memory is just, it's over. <laughs> They don't recall those things easily. It has to be done right then and there. So, you know, that's a big part of it. And you say, well, that's difficult. I don't know if I like that. Well, it's in the Bible, first of all. So if you don't like it, you can go ahead and take it up with God. Yeah. But the thing I, is, you think that's hard. It, and it is, isn't it? It is hard to do that. And it's a lot easier to just yell at the child. You know, it's a lot easier just to scream at them. But is that really going to accomplish what? Is that going to deliver their soul from hell? Is that going to bring them up in, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? To teach them right from wrong? To teach them that there are consequences, severe, painful consequences for, uh, for doing wrong? Not as well as a spanking, nowhere near it. Uh, you know, spankings are something that God has put there and instituted because it's very effective at teaching a child that there are direct and immediate consequences for misbehavior. And that's something that needs to be in a child's life. It absolutely must be there. Uh, it says, thou shalt. That is a command. Uh, that's the 11th commandment, right? We should write that down. <clears throat> and, you know, it's easier to yell. It's easier to just slam something, slam your fist on the table, slam, kick, scream, yell. You know, I've never gotten to this point. I don't think that I can recall, maybe my wife can correct me later, of actually throwing something, maybe not at the child, but just to get their attention. You know, we're much larger than children. It's easy to just be try to physically intimidate them through fear and show, you know, make them fear for the for, for in some way. But that's really not what we're trying to instill in our children. We want them to understand that there are consequences for their behavior. Yeah. And you know, spanking is not something I think that should be done in anger. And this is why it's hard. This is why it's difficult because spanking is often uh, something that you do because the child has angered you. You know, they've misbehaved. They've done something wrong, and it makes you upset. You know, you've told them time and time and time and time and time again, don't do this, and they go ahead and do it. Because uh, the Bible says that foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And, it doesn't, and you know, I don't think that's just a little gentle slipknot when it's that foolishness that's bound in, their, in, the, in the heart of a child. I mean, it's bound in there like a knot. I mean, it's in there tight. Some kids more than others. I mean, some kids, you think that, I mean, it's, it's, it's like you think bound, it's cemented. 
You know, I'm going to get a jackhammer to this thing, right? I know when I used to work with heavy equipment, you know, Brother Hunter probably can relate to this, when we used to tie knots and toe straps and things like that. You have to lift something. If you ever wanted to get that knot back out after it's had a heavy uh, weight on it, you can't just pull it apart. I mean, we used to have to drive truck tires over it just to loosen up that knot, and then you could finally start to pull it apart. Well, it's the same way with foolishness in your child's heart, and that's what spanking does. It, it drives it far from them. It's not a one-time thing. I spank them, and now it's over. Sometimes kids, I know my children have to be spanked the same things over and over and over and over again. And what are you doing? You're loosening up that knot, so finally when they get older and as they mature, that foolishness starts to depart from them. They start to understand why they shouldn't do those things. Not just because there's a spanking involved, but they see why they shouldn't do that because it's sin or because it's not what is expected, uh, you know, just out, of, out of, of being a, you know, a civil human being. You know, you can't just throw your food on the floor every time you go to the restaurant. You know, you got to train those kids and, and teach them that kind of thing. That's what we have, we're trying to teach our kids how to behave and how do we do that through discipline. And again, it's not something that we should do in anger. It should be something that's done calmly. And I know this is a big ask. You know, I know this is something that we all have to work on, self-included, that we have to do it calmly and, you know, and probably have some kind of a, 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 reg, a, a, some kind of a standard of, of what kind of spanking we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And really, I don't want to dwell the whole sermon on this one aspect. This, this topic of spanking deserves its own sermon. It's that important. And it's something that's falling on the wayside today, even amongst Christians, even amongst Baptists, that are just letting their kids get away with it. There's no consequences. And those kids are growing up, and, and they're going the way of the devil. Or, you know, they, there's parents that are all about the spanking. You know, they make it everything about the spanking. There is no, you know, love. There is no instruction. They just want to run their house like, you know, a military boot camp. But there's no instruction. There's no love. There's no uh, a tenderness either. So there's a balance here. And, I, of course, you know, I'm already kind of going off on it. And, I, and I, I'd rather just move along in the sermon here. But let's not forget the point here, that training up a child is difficult and that training up a child is work and that it's something that falls you know, a lot on the mother. It's something that she has to be willing and able to do. So again, just a reminder that you know motherhood this morning is work. You know, not just in the actual bringing forth of children, but then going on and training those children's uh, those children in the right way of the Lord. And it's something that needs to be uh, repeated. You know, more probably than just once a year because the fact is that today in America many women are avoiding this work entirely this work of motherhood they don't want anything to do with it they're more interested in themselves and what they're going to do with their lives and what they want and uh, then what God wants or what God expects of them and uh, you know there's a thing that's going on now called being child free this is a new I don't know how new it is, but it's a term. It's new to me. It's just a term I just recently read that there's actually a thing out there called being child-free. You know, they make it sound, uh, you know, so great. It's like being cancer-free or, you know, some other uh, ailment-free, right? They, they want to already casting children just by that term alone as if it's like some negative connotation to even have a child. You know, I've been stricken with children. You know, I'm in, I'm in the fourth stages of, of, of parenthood. You know, I, you know, it's, it's stage four parenthood with me. You know, please pray for me. But, you know, this whole thing of being child-free is something that's taking off even in America. It says here in the study that I read that being a child-free Ameri American adult was considered unusual in the 1950s. I mean, it used to be it was unusual to not grow up, become an adult, get married, and have kids. If you didn't do that, you were, you were the oddball, right? Now it seems today like it's almost turned on its head, like, even if you, the people say, okay, yeah, go ahead and have kids, but make sure it's only one or two. You know, make sure you don't have too many. I mean, I've only got, I remember when I had my third, people were already starting to make their comments. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, you, you can start saying that kind of stuff when I have seven or eight. You know, then I, then I get it. It doesn't make any sense when you're saying when I have three. Don't you know what causes that? Why don't you get a TV, you know? Those these kind of dumb comments that people make about having kids. <clears throat> but today it's just getting... You know, people who are having children, especially people who are having multiple children, they're considered the oddballs. Well, not too long ago, it was the reverse. It was the people who were living the single life and being child-free that were the, were the odd ducks. Uh, however, the proportion of childless adults in the population has increased significantly since the 50s. The proportion of childish, uh, childlessness 
among the proportion of childlessness among women aged 40 to 44 was 10% in 1976. It reached a high of 20% in 2005, then declined a little bit in 2014. And uh, you know, it goes on and says here from 2007 to 2011, the fertility rate in the United States declined 9%. Uh, the Pew Research Center reporting in 2010 that the birth rate was the lowest in U.S. history and that child, uh, child freeness rose across all racial and ethnic groups uh, to about 1 in 5 versus 1 in 10. So like, um, what is that? I have like 50%. That's a huge increase in the, from the 70s. The CDC released a st uh, statistics in the first quarter of 2016 confirming that the U.S. fertility rate had fallen to its lowest point since keeping a record in, the in 1909. And that was just a few years removed. That we've gotten to a point in this country where where we're at the low, I mean, there's more people that have lived in this country than any, at any time before, but we have the lowest fertility rate. Uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's an epidemic that's taking place, and it's an attitude that's becoming very per pervasive in our uh, culture and our society where people are saying that they'd rather just not have children, that they'd rather not uh, bear children, and say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, you know, the Bible uh, commands people, uh, uh, us, at, to, to have children. It's a biblical command. And if you're one that says, oh, I'm going to not have children, and you're going to take either remain single, you know, uh, and, and just get on some kind of drug, or you're going to take measures into your own hands to prevent uh, the conception and birth of children, you know, you're going against God's commandments. Yep. You know, and I know that makes me some kind of a dinosaur to say that. I know that makes me some kind of the odd duck in the room to just come out and say that. But that's what the Bible teaches. Yep. The Bible's very clear. It says that you're there. If you're probably not still there, but if you were there, you could go back to Genesis 1.28. I'll read it to you, where it says that God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So from the very beginning, God's intent was that man would be fruitful and multiply. And you know, not just replace himself and his spouse, but actually have multiple children. You know, God wants the earth to be full. Don't buy into this whole, all this uh, overpopulation nonsense. Right. You know, people are just bu buying this hook, line, and sinker that there's just too many people in the world today, that our resources are so strapped that, you know, that we can't support human life anymore, that people need to stop having children. I mean, I'm seeing, who saw those two idiot women on, on Facebook, that video that went around? You know, you guys saw that? And this woman's just advocating, just saying, don't have children. The earth cannot support anymore. We need women to stop having children. Yep. As she's sitting there next to her daughter, yep. you know, uh, and, and and just this is but this is the mentality that's out there today, and you know it's being taught in, in institutions uh, like universities and other places where they're teaching women to, to to you know pursue a career to do other things other than what God has commanded them to do. They say, well, God, you know, He did command women to just stay at home and have children. That's actually exactly what He commanded them. Yeah. Hmm. And if you would, turn over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. While you're turning Titus chapter 2, by the way, in the New Testament, I'll read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 5, where it says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion of the, to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some have turned aside already after Satan. So he says right there, he says, I will, meaning I want. And of course, it's the Apostle Paul speaking, God speaking through him and giving his commands to the New Testament church and telling us there that the younger women are to marry, bear children, and guide the house and to give none occasion to the adversary to speak approachably. Now that, fly, that flies right in the face of today's uh, worldly philosophy, doesn't it? You know, they, they would say, boy, you guys are a bunch of oppressive, misogynistic, uh, I don't know what the other words are, you're masochistic, is that one of them that's out there now? I don't know. <laughs> you know, that you're just some uh, chest thumping, you know, caveman, a knuckle-dragging caveman that just wants to oppress women. You know, we want to oppress women by actually asking them to do the most feminine thing there is. Yeah. You know, to bear children. You know, to do the one thing, uh, to do to do uh, something that only women can do, yeah. which is bear children. You know, and to, and to be what God has uh, created them to be. And, you know, that's not, that's not oppressive. That's actually liberating. And when we think about today, what they're telling women, what women's lib is, they'll tell you, oh, if you want to be liberated as a woman, go act like a man. Yep. Go cut your hair short and pull on a pair of slacks and get a job and work a nine to five and don't have any kids and act like a man. And today, that's what the world calls being a woman. Right. Well, that's not being a woman. 
Not, not according to Scripture. Uh, and God desires that women uh, marry and bear children. Amen. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that uh, that's necessarily easy. After all, the title of the sermon today is Motherhood is Work. And I'm going to just say that flippantly as if uh, there, there aren't, you know, uh, things that need to be considered. But that is what the Bible says. The Bible does say that women are to bear children and to be mothers. Look here in Titus chapter 2. It says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Okay? So now he's going to give us a list of the things that he wants Titus to speak. He's going to give us a list of things that he classifies as sound doctrine. These are right words. These are wholesome words to live by. Verse 2, That aged men be sober, brave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So again, another command in Scripture, God desires that women would stay home, to keep the home, and to raise children. And let's not forget today that a woman that is fulfilling that God-given role is a woman who's fulfilling a, a job. She is working. You know, I saw that meme go up on Facebook of where a husband uh, he had the audacity to actually take a nice picture of his wife and, and put it in a frame, and right above it, employee of the month, and hang it in the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> the nerve of that man! You know, to me, that looks like the sign of a healthy relationship. <laughs> you know, I, and she, she's probably she. I think she was even the one that posted it. Maybe not, I don't know, but uh, you know, it was still up long enough for him to take the picture, right? I thought maybe if I, if I bet if I did that, my wife would probably get a chuckle out of it. Don't answer that, honey. But you know, um, I thought that looked like a healthy relationship. There's a sense of humor there. They're both fulfilling their roles and happy to do it. Um, you know, but let's not forget that, you know, it is an employee of the month. You know, my wife's the employee of the month every month of the year, you know, and my wife I remember when I first, my wife first started staying home and people would ask me, say, well, what does your wife do? Does she work? And I, I had this bad habit of saying no. And she stays at home and raises the kids. And it dawned on me one day, that's work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, and when she would give birth and I'd have to stay for a week or two and help as she recovered, I'd realize, like, this, this is really work. You know? This is a lot that goes on here. You do this every single day of your life. Yeah. Feeding and changing diapers. And, Cleaning up messes and making food and keeping house and doing that's a lot of work. Yeah, right. And even with all the modern conveniences that we have today, it's still a lot of work to do. Going out and doing the shopping and everything else that's involved. <laughs> you know, so I started telling people, yeah, my wife works, she works for me. You know, she's my best employee. All right. Uh, and I pay her well. At least I think I do. <laughs> I gave her a cookbook for Mother's Day, if you can believe that. She wanted it, all right? <laughs> like, Are you, should you give your wife a cookbook on Mother's Day? <laughs> What's the message here, you know? She could have been happier to get it. So anyway, I don't know who was really blessed by that kind of thing. You know, it's see it. She wanted it, she got it. So, you know, um, amen to both of us. Amen. But, you know, God, you say, well, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that God would command a woman to go to stay at home and work. You know, and I think women should be entitled to go out and put on a name tag and a hairnet and, and stand behind a counter and ask, do you want fries with that? Or go on and put on a, you know, a fluorescent vest and hold a, a, a traffic sign for heavy, uh, to stop mm -hmm. traffic on road work, you know, or whatever role they want to do. You know, they, they should be able to do anything that a man does. You know, well, then you don't like God. You don't like what God commands women. That, that's just the that's just the facts. And you know, we have to understand that God is a God who puts His children to work. You know, whether you're a man or a woman, God commands. You know, it's not just a a free for all. It's not just you know I'm saved now and I get to loaf until I go to heaven. God wants work out of His children and gives us opportunity to actually earn rewards in heaven. And and praise God for that. And He that includes mothers as well. And, you know, perhaps more so than most, you know, most of God's children. I, I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to find a person who does more work than a mother who's doing it right. Uh, but today, you know, women, they don't want uh, any, they don't want this. They don't want to stay at home. They want the career. They want, uh, you know, their own ambitions and desires. Um, and, and that don't include being a mother. And today, you know, many women, uh, they might even go ahead and have the children, 
and then just subcontract the work that they're supposed to do out. They'll just have somebody else to do the work that God has commanded them to do. And that's, that's the case today as well. In fact, I was reading another study or uh, article that says that in most U.S. families, all of, the work, uh, all of the adults work. Fewer than one in three children today have a full-time stay-at-home parent. Fewer than one in three. Fewer than one in three. Less than one-third today of children in this country have a full-time stay-at-home parent. And you wonder why our, our, our country is in the condition it's in. Yep. Yeah. Because they're not being raised by the mother. They're not being taught godly principles. They're being taught godlessness, heathenism, wickedness, those things which God despises yeah. are just being pumped into our children's minds. True. Just day in and day out. Just being indoctrinated. You know, to the point of where there's less than one-third today of children that have a full-time stay-at-home mom. In 1975, only a generation ago, more than half of all children had a stay-at-home parent, usually the mother. We've gone from just a few decades, from half to less than one-third. Now, you know, that, that this is something that's just swept over our nation, our philosophy, our way of thinking, like a wildfire. It's, our culture has just changed so radically. Family, or care, uh, family care remains the most common type of child care arrangement across, across all marital and employment statuses. Three quarters of full-time employed mothers utilize some form of family care at least part of the time. The annual cost of child care for an infant care center is higher than a year's tuition at the average four-year public college in most states. It's cheaper to go get a college education than to have infant care. Than to drop your kid off and have them watch your kid for a few hours. You, you could go get a four-year degree at a community college cheaper than that. Low-income families, and this is who's really suffering the most from this, low-income families spend a much larger portion of their income on child care. The average income for a family making less than $1,500 per month was $938 in 2010. Now that's an incredibly low amount of money. I mean, I, I'd have a hard time making that one, uh, living on that when I was single, let alone raising a family. Mm -hmm. And they say half of that, that $938, is spent on child care. I mean, that's that low-income families are ones really that are, are bearing the brunt of this. On average, I mean, I mean, do you wonder why ghettos have some of the worst children, the problems with gangs the most? It's because they're so poor and then they're still, they have to go to work. And they're dropping these kids off, they're dropping out, and they're getting into drugs and violence. They don't have moms and they're staying at home. Yeah. And it doesn't make any sense. It would be cheaper for you to stay at home. Yeah. I mean, just from the financial aspect. It would be cheaper in the long run and in the short term for moms to just stay at home and let dad go work. And, you know, I would rather be the type of man that would be willing to work two jobs yeah. to keep my wife at home. Amen. And to rather come home after a long day and say, now I'm ready to uh, watch out the kids, put them to bed, feed them while you go off and work another job. Or vice versa, or however that schedule is supposed to work. You know, or, or you know, heaven forbid, actually put my children into some kind of daycare, or put my children into some kind of, uh, you know, place where let somebody else raise them so we can go earn more. You know, a lot of people, they, 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 they don't have enough money because they're living beyond their means. They want more than they really need. You know, I can't afford to raise my kids. We have to get a job. Well, why don't you cut off that smartphone? You know, why don't you get rid of the smartphone? Why don't you get rid of the cable television? Why don't you get rid of uh, the second vehicle? <gasps> you know, there's a lot of places people could probably cut corners and keep mom at home and maybe have to eat beans and rice, but at least you wouldn't raise some godless child. Yeah. Some child that's gonna not that's going to depart from the ways of the Lord, that might even, his soul might even be delivered into hell. Because he never had a mother that would stay home and do the work of a mother and teach him the Bible. Because they're more worried about money. And the ridiculousness of this article is that they turn to the government. That's the that's the whole point of this article. They say more than two thirds of Americans agree that the government or business uh, should be doing more to help fund child care for working parents. Look, that's not the answer, friend. The answer is not the government or some private company stepping in and providing you child care. That's not the answer to what you need. <clears throat> you know, all that money, all that time off and benefits and paid vacations that a career offers is all going to be for naught. When that precious little baby that you brought into this world 
grows up and doesn't know God, doesn't love God, doesn't want anything to do with the Bible or church. And it happens. It happens all the time. You know, just bringing kids to church on a Sunday isn't enough. You have to get involved in their lives. And the best way to do it is to keep mom at home and let them, let her raise them. <clears throat> the Bible says in Proverbs 29, are you still in Proverbs? Go ahead and turn over to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. The Bible reads in Proverbs 29, verse 15, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. It's interesting that it says it brings his mom to shame, not his father. It brings his mother to shame. Because again, mother is the one that is expected to stay at home and raise the children and to instruct and to guide and to give the rod and to give the reproof. Not to say that, God, or that dad doesn't have a time and place to step in and, and do it when it's appropriate or when he's available. But by and large, if women are fulfilling God, the biblical command to stay home, to marry, to bear children, to guide the house, they're the one that's going to be applying the rod, they're going to be the ones that are giving the reproof, and if they fail to do that, it's going to be to their shame. And it's going to be to their hurt in the long run. And you know, that, that, that career is not going to be worth it when the son or the daughter turns out to be a God-hater. It's just not going to be worth it. <clears throat> so, you know, the title again, the sermon is uh, The Work of Motherhood. Or Motherhood is Work. Motherhood is Work. And I, I think I've made it pretty clear that, you know, it's a lot of work for a mom uh, this morning. They've got a lot on their plate. They have a lot of responsibility. There's a great deal uh, that falls on their shoulders as mothers to fulfill that role. And, uh, you know, most mothers in here probably don't need that reminder this morning. You know, if they're trying to do that, they don't need to be reminded. They're saying, uh, yeah, Captain Obvious up there in the pulpit this morning <laughs> trying to tell me that motherhood is work. You know, you probably have a pretty good grasp of that. And really, who I'd like to really drive this home to is the children this morning. It's a Mother's Day sermon, but really it's the kids that should understand something. Because I look around, and I see mothers that stay at home. I see mothers that desire that for their lives or, and, uh, and are able to do that and are raising children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And if you're a child today who has a mother who is doing the work of a mother as she ought to, you know, Mother's Day isn't enough. You know, it should, Mother's Day is every day for you. And you should be grateful for a mother who works. Uh, you know, God doesn't appreciate people mistreating His employees. And okay, we're going to look at that here. I mean, God has given a given woman a very specific task. And it's a lot of work. And when he sees uh, people mistreating his employees, God comes down pretty heavy on them. If you would, turn over to Leviticus chapter 19. I want the kids to pay attention to this. Because a lot of kids today that, are, that have the benefit, I said the benefit and the privilege and the honor of growing up in a godly home this morning where uh, you know, the situation is right, where mom has been able to stay home and, 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 keep, and, and raise the kids as they desire to do, if you're a privileged enough this morning to have that, don't ever take that for granted. Amen. And don't ever get an attitude uh, towards your mother of, of, um, of bitterness or anger or talking bad about her or having a wrong attitude in your heart because, oh, because she's so strict. Well, she's keeping you from, 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 trying, from going uh, after the devil, trying to keep you from the things that would hurt you, trying to keep from the things that would pollute you. Or she asks, so she wants us to do that and that, this and that, trying to build character into your life, trying to teach you some principles in life that are going to help you in the long run. Yeah. Help you to be a responsible adult and not a failure in life. That's why there's rules. Now look at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Leviticus 19, verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say to them, Ye shall be holy, for the, I the Lord your God am holy. Uh, you shall fear every man, his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. I mean, he's, he, he, and it's in the same breath, the same sense as keeping the Sabbaths. And God was pretty serious about the Sabbaths. And he says in that same breath, that same sentence even, that we are to fear our fathers and our mothers. You know, and that's not just, you know, uh, uh, that's, that's the type of fear where we'd be afraid to cross them or do them wrong or to treat them poorly. 
that we should fear them, that we should respect them, that we should reverence them, that we should honor them. Uh, look at, uh, go ahead and turn over to, uh, go to Exodus chapter 21. This is, this is a heavy one. If you're going to Exodus 21, I'll read from Proverbs 23. Hearken unto thy father that beget thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. You know, God expects us to honor our parents throughout our whole life, not just when we're children, but even when she is old, that we should not despise our mothers when she is old. We shouldn't be bitter towards our mothers. Oh, they, they didn't let me do this and that as a child. You know, I didn't get to, you know, Billy down the street got to do this and do that. I, I had such a deprived childhood. You know, and what you don't see is all the things that little Billy got into later in life. Yeah. Or the way he turned out. And, right. and, and you're, and you're going to be upset about the way mom and dad raised you because they were a little strict. Because they didn't uh, give you the same liberties that some uh, unsaved parent is giving to your friend down the street. Look here uh, at uh, Exodus chapter 21, verse 17. And he that curseth his father or mother shall surely be put to death. That's a, that's a serious verse. That is an incredibly serious verse. The Bible says, I'll read to you in Proverbs 20, it reiterates this. Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. That's, this is, this, God does not take it lightly when uh, children are starting to mistreat their parents. Even the more so when that mother that a child is criticizing or being negative towards is a godly mother who is fulfilling the God-given role that she's been given to do. And let me just say this to all the kids in the room. Don't you ever criticize your parents to anyone. Ever. Not even in your own heart. Amen. You shouldn't be doing it. And if you're doing that in your heart this morning as children, or even as adults, you need to get down on your knees and confess that to God and forsake it and Amen. get it right. And you know, the person that's going to go behind their parents' backs and, and openly criticize their own parents to another person, that, that's a, that is serious business with God. That you should not curse your father or mother. And if you did, to the point where God would say, put them to death. And that's how serious God takes parenthood. Amen. How important it is. You know, uh, mothers are, there's a big ask on moms. You know, especially when what they're being asked to do is uh, countercultural. When it goes against the grain of society. When they're going to get the funny looks at the grocery store because they have, you know, a few kids in tow. And, they're, and, the, daughter, and the ladies are all in skirts. And they get the weird look, you know. My wife's at the grocery store the other day and some snot-nosed kid says, boy, I, I don't know, I hardly have time for myself. I can't imagine what a mother of four would be like. Well, you know, you, you know what? She doesn't have time for herself. That's what motherhood is. It's sacrifice. It's giving up self. It's giving up her ambitions, her desires to be a lawyer or a doctor or a street sweeper or whatever it is <laughs> that women are, these, these grand pursuits that, they're, uh, that are out there apparently. Uh, for women to, to endeavor to do. Um, they give up all that to fulfill the, the, the ro a role that can only be filled by women, yeah. which is motherhood. So don't ever take that for granted, kids. Don't ever criticize your parents. Don't ever have a, a negative attitude towards your parents, especially your mother, who would, uh, uh, especially today, right, on Mother's Day. They do a lot for us because mother would, motherhood is work. And the Bible says in Proverbs, if you would, turn over to Proverbs 31. We'll close here. Proverbs 31. That would be the wrong kind of attitude to have towards your parents, towards your mother. To be a critical uh, spirit, to curse your, your, your mother or your father. The Bible says here there is a correct attitude to have towards your mother or towards your, the mother of your children even. It says in Proverbs 31, verse 28, 28, Her children arise up and call her blessed. Have we done that lately, kids? Have we rose up and blessed our mother? Her husband also, and praised with her. Yes, yes, I've done that. <laughs> Probably not as often as I should, to be honest. Um, they're worthy of it. If they're doing it right, they're worthy of it every day of their life. But that... that we love that verse. You know, it was in the bulletin this morning. It's very nice. It's very, it's very, it sounds very nice. We like the idea of that, of a mother being praised, and, and, and then they ought to be. But it applies to a very specific kind of woman in the context of this chapter. It's not just doled out to every, every single woman. 
It says here, go to back to verse 10. Let's look at the type of woman that is to be blessed by her husband and her children. It says in verse 10, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall need no need of spoil. She will do him good uh, uh, and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth her meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand she planted the vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by, uh, by night. She layeth her hand to the spindle, and her hands to the, to the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it. She delivereth girdles into the merchant, uh, unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is a lie of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Then comes verse 28. After all that. And look, I believe what we're seeing here is the ideal woman. Something that is to be striven for. Something that is to be pursued after. You know, this is, this is you know, as it says there, she's, uh, you know, her price is far above rubies. Who can find some virtuous woman? They're very difficult to come by. And this is something that a woman should endeavor to be like. I'm not saying every woman is, you know, you're going to fulfill every one of these attributes, but we see that one of the main attributes of this woman, this virtuous woman, who has deemed herself worthy of being praised by her children and her husband, rising up early even and praising her, that type of woman is a woman who works. There's a lot of work going on here. She's not busy, as it says there. She looketh well to the house of her, of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Mm -hmm. You know, she's not on Facebook for three hours. She's not scrolling YouTube comments. You know, she's busy raising children and, and doing what needs to be done. She is not a self-absorbed woman that cares only about what she can get out of it. It says there in verse 30, it says, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. You know, she's, she cares more about the well-being of her family than, you know, going to the gym. You know, and how she's going to look in a pair of yoga pants. Yeah. Yeah. And that's out there. Yeah. They're, they're more concerned, excuse me, they're more concerned with their profile pic. Yeah. You know, and their avatar right. on YouTube. You know, and whether the light's hitting them just right, and if the filter's doing a good job, <laughs> than they are about their own house. That's right. They're over in the corner on the computer, on the tablet, on the phone, and, you know, little Billy's running around with a full diaper and, and, peanut butter all over the place and who knows what look I can tell you stories folks I, I've known women like this oh. that have come downstairs from doing you know smoking their pot or whatever and found their little three year old had climbed up on top of a stove a gas stove climbed on top of a gas stove got into the cupboards and poured oil olive oil all over the stove to get to some sprinkles you know, some little decorative candy sprinkles. What if his little foot had turned the gas on the way yeah. up? Yeah. What would she have come down and found in her stupor, in her, you know, in her her state of mind? I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you know. There's there's terrible things that happen out there, because uh, you know, women they get distracted, they start caring more about themselves than they do about the children that God has given them. And, uh, you know, that's not the type of woman that's going to, uh, you know, uh, be praised in life, that's going to be praised by her children and be praised uh, by her husband. It's going to be the woman that's watching her children, paying attention to her children, teaching, instructing, disciplining, reproving, raising those children as she ought to. And, you know, a woman that is willing to sacrifice her body, her mind, and, desi and her desires for what? For children to raise the next generation for God. And really, it's a, and the, what's great about this passage here is that uh, the working mother, which is a redundant term, by the way, uh, the working mother has something to show for her efforts. You know, the, the, the one who doesn't want to raise her children as she ought to, 
you know, you know, newsflash, we're all going to get old one day. You know, we're all, we're all going to be ugly one day, right? We're all not going to look as good as we used to one day. What, what are you going to have to show in the end? Yeah. Is it really going to matter how good that profile pic was? That's right. How much time, how many squats you did in the gym? Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, you dropped off the kids at the daycare so you could go down to the LA Fitness and, and, and right. get with your girlfriends and, and, and <laughs> try to just get a look. It's not going to matter. That's right. It's not going to matter. But the working mother who's willing to sacrifice all those things, she's going to be the one that has something to show for her efforts Amen. in her old age. Yep. It says here in verse 30, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Not, not will be, she shall be. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. You know, they're going to grow older, the children are going to grow up, and what are they going to have to show? You know, the woman who's doing the work, she's going to have her own works praising her in the gates. It says she shall be praised. By who? Who is it that's going to praise her? It's going to be the fruit of her own hands. It says, give her the fruit of her hands, let her own works praise her in her gates. That's who's going to praise her. Well, who is that? That's the children. Yeah. That is the fruit. That's who's going to praise her in her old age. That's who's going to honor her in the old age. When all that other superficial stuff no longer matters. When it's all that vanity is over and can no longer be achieved. It's going to be her children that honor her. You know, all women, you know, like the rest of us, just like men, we all get old. But not all women are going to be praised at that time. It's going to be the mother who did the work that God had given her to do. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, would probably, a lot, most mothers, I would assume, they would desire the praise that a godly mother is deserved. They would want uh, the hear their children and, their, and the gates coming and going uh, from their home as, the, as when they're adults. And thanking them and praising them for the childhood and the upbringing that their mother gave them. A lot of women would probably desire that. But you have to understand this morning that it comes through sacrifice. And it comes through sacrifices, quite frankly, that today in this country a lot of women aren't willing to make. They're just not willing to make it anymore. That that kind of praise that a godly woman deserves, it comes through work that many today would rather just leave undone. Or have somebody else do. Well, you can't, you can't have it both ways. You know, you got to take the good with the bad. I'm not saying raising children is, is bad, but it's not easy. You can't just expect the children to turn out and come back and praise you in the gates, break your own fruit of your hands, praising you in the gates when they're, you know, and, and when they're older, without having put in the work, yeah. without having made the sacrifices. It doesn't make any sense to expect otherwise. So it takes work, you know, and and it's going to be the mother that's doing the work that is going to be praised when when she is older. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer.